Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today is February 14th, and I just got back from Utah in Salt Lake City for the Western Hunting uh, and Conservation Expo. And I was up there for Thursday and Friday of the show, and it was great to get to see a lot of uh, people and friendly faces and and, uh, podcast listeners I had a ton of people come up and say they love the podcast and I just want to thank you guys for your support and this episode is going to be a great episode it's actually a two-part series with Andy Galliano and Andy has a podcast called the Turkey Hunter podcast you can also find uh, his podcast and more information on Andy at his website, IamTurkeyHunting.com. And Andy actually did an interview with me uh, last year, last spring, uh, prior prior to the 2015 uh, turkey season. And in this episode, he asked me all sorts of questions about uh, the Gould's turkey. And um, so this is um, a pretty uh, info-filled podcast episode so I've broken it into a two-part series and I encourage you if you like turkey hunting definitely listen to Andy's podcast he has some great people on his uh, podcast and um, so there's a lot of information and he's a wealth of knowledge so uh, this is going to be kind of an interesting episode because he's actually interviewing me Uh, I was actually on his podcast episode 32 Um, So this is just my recording of that episode. And I also wanted to uh, tell you guys about the Western Hunting Expo. The Western Hunting Expo, they have auctions at the expo. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that were auctioned off, uh, the the Colorado Statewide Pronghorn Antelope Tag sold for $6,000. A Pavant landowner elk tag sold for a uh, hunter's choice on season 38,000. Colorado statewide elk tag 27.5. Uh, let's see here. Um, a Ponsagant landowner a deer hunter's choice of season 24,000. Uh, Book Cliffs, uh, Bitter Creek South of uh, 15,000. Washington East Side deer tag sold for 13.5. Uh, San Carlos Apache Tribe uh, Commissioner's Coos Deer Tag sold for $15,500. Uh, Ponsagant Landowner Deer Hunter's Choice Tag sold for $2,400. Uh, Utah Book Cliffs uh, Roadless uh, Multi Season for Elk sold for $18,000. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Sedeka Safari's five day two on one Plains Game Hunt uh, sold for $300. Uh, which that obviously had to be a super value. Um, P- Ponsagant Landowner Deer, Deer Hunter's Choice, another one for $24,000. Um, let's see, the Montana Super Statewide Deer Tag for $21,000. A, a Utah Plateau Boulder uh, Kaparowitz Archery Elk uh, Conservation Tag sold for $19,000. The Dutton, Utah elk tag, uh, multi-season elk tag sold for 18000 The uh, Jumping Jack trailer sold for $52.50. Uh, Montana deer hunt sold for $17.50. You've got a, a Browning 300 win mag sold for $12.50. Uh, Zeiss 15 by 45 by 65 spotting scope sold for $1,900. Uh, Panguitch Lake. Uh, multi-season elk tag sold for twenty thousand. Uh, that's just a one example of that was on, I believe, Friday's auction. Uh, there's uh, the Plateau Boulder elk conservation permit sold for thirty-two thousand. The New Mexico special deer permit sold for eighty-five thousand. Uh, Utah statewide cougar sold for thirteen thousand. Uh, Zion Pine Valley Late Desert Bighorn Sheep sold for sixty thousand. A Pavant Landowner Elk Tag Hunter's Choice sold for thirty six thousand. Uh, Nevada's Heritage Statewide Mule Deer Tag sold for one hundred and five thousand. Wyoming's Governor Deer Elk or Antelope sold for twenty two five. 
The Utah Kaparowitz Desert Bighorn Sheep sold for $60,000. Uh, Utah Plateau Boulder Kaparowitz Multi-Season Elk sold for $35,000. The Wasatch Moose Conservation Permit sold for $32,500. Uh, Utah Rocky Mountain Goat Conservation Permit sold for $25,000. Hickory uh, Mule Deer Auction Permit sold for $75,000. Uh, Chris Kyle Custom Sniper Rifle sold for $15,000. Uh, Utah Statewide Bison Conservation Permit sold for $29,000. Oregon Statewide Mule Deer sold for $35,000. Utah Statewide Bear sold for $21,000. Utah Oak Creek Landowner Permit sold for $18,000. The San Carlos Apache Tribes Commissioner's Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep Tag sold for $65,000. The Utah Southwest Desert uh, Multi-Season Elk Tag sold for $29,000. Uh, Utah Henry Mountain Muzzleloader Deer Permit sold for $85,000. The San Juan Multi-Season Elk Conservation Permit sold for $44,000. The Arizona Statewide uh, Auction Coos Tag sold for $55,000. Uh, the Wyoming's Governor Deer and Elk and Antelope Tag sold for $22,000. And the big item of the night on Friday night was the Antelope Island Mule Deer Permit sold for a whopping $410,000. So that was uh, pretty incredible. And then they finished up the auction um, with... A lot of cool things being sold. The New Mexico Special Big Game Enhancement Package, 125,000. Wyoming's Governor's Moose Tag, 30,000. Utah Statewide Moose Tag, 47,000. Uh, they sold a mule named Copper, uh, donated by Wyoming Wilderness Outfitters for 18,500. Uh, the Owens Valley Thule Elk Permit sold for 42,000. The Utah Statewide Pronghorn. A conservation permit sold for fourteen thousand. The Arizona mule deer, uh, con or uh, mule deer auction tag sold for four hundred thousand uh, dollars. The Utah Southwest Desert multi-season elk conservation permit sold for twenty-five. The Utah Desert statewide desert sheep tag sold for sixty-five. The Utah Henry Mountain conservation permit sold for one twenty. The state, Utah Statewide Elk Conservation Permit sold for 120. The Colorado Statewide Mule Deer Tag sold for 100. Uh, the Utah Henry Mountain Deer Conservation Permit sold for 100,000. The Utah Statewide M Montana Goat Conservation sold for 35,000. Uh, the Utah Statewide Mule Deer Conservation Permit sold for 140,000. Uh, the uh, let's see here. The San Carlos Apache Tribe Desert Bighorn Sheep Tag sold for $50,000. Uh, Kuyu Best of the Best, a full collection of, the, of their gear sold for $32,000. Um, the Hickory Mule Deer and Elk Combo Auction Permit sold for $42,500. A Marco Polo Sheep Hunt sold for $25,000. Uh, Weatherby Mark V Royal Ultra Mark sold for $32,500 or excuse me, $3,250. And the Antelope Island, California, uh, Bighorn Sheep Permit sold for $85,000. So a lot of money was raised for the animals that we love to hunt. A lot of money was raised in the name of conservation. And uh, I actually bought a bunch of $5 raffle tickets. Uh, they they uh, have a drawing that non-residents and residents alike have equal opportunity. You pay $5 and I was able to buy um, archery tags and some of the best units uh, tickets for that. I was able to buy uh, archery muzzleloader and rifle permits uh, or, or tickets for um, the elk permits, the mule deer permits. Uh, the mountain goat, uh, the sheep there in Utah, and uh, the the uh, winners are going to be announced, I believe, February 19th. So hopefully, um, maybe uh, it'll be my day to, to uh, draw a, a raffle tag. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. It was great to see a lot of listeners out there and uh, great to interact with them. It was great to see a bunch of companies uh, that I really like uh, and sponsors of this podcast uh, GoHunt.com had a great booth there and um, had a ton of activity there in the booth. Um, they had it set up. They had actually a, a kind of a four-sided booth and had computers 
basically down both sides and uh, or two of the sides. And every time I went by there, there were people checking out the Go Hunt Insider and and uh, the guys from GoHunt.com were were uh, showing how the Insider works. And the new draw odds is nothing short of spectacular. It is um, it is amazing. Actually, I learned a few things there that I didn't know that the draw odds could do. Um, clicked on a few boxes and actually um, got some education on on how the insider works and just blown away. I'm I'm working on my Utah applications and uh, the, the the recent podcast episodes that I've done with Trill Kreitzer and Adam Bronson really helped. Uh, but also being able to go back on the Go Hunt Insider and look at how many applicants applied for that same unit, uh, look at the allocated tag amounts. Um, look at the unit breakdowns and profiles. Um, just awesome. So uh, that was cool. Uh, the Kuyu booth was just rocking every time I went by there. It was great to see uh, Jason Harrison and Brendan Burns just um, in the trenches. Um, you know, you wonder how that company has been so successful and, you know, sold $30 million worth of gear last year. Uh, the owner, the face of the company is in the trenches he was at SCI last week. He was at the Western Hunting uh, Expo here in Salt Lake City uh, talking with his customers face to face. Not only do they b make incredible gear uh, for a cheaper price for their customers, uh, but they they talk to you face to face and they're hunters. And it was uh, it's no wonder that they do so well. They build incredible gear, but they also have incredible face to face personal service. And I want to commend Jason on that. Uh, it was great to see the guys at the Outdoorsman's uh, selling a bunch of optics and answering a bunch of questions. They are the optics authority. And, uh, you know, Cody Nelson over there and his staff were doing a great job uh, selling a lot of product. But also I saw them answering a lot of questions and going through uh, the tripods and the spotting scopes and the binoculars and all the different things that they sell. Uh, that was fantastic. I got to see um Cheston uh over there at uh, phone scope and and also got to see the guys at utah hydrographics and uh, those guys had a big killer booth and you know people were just mauling them um you know checking out the phone scope product and it was awesome to see those guys uh the wilderness athlete guys uh were there selling product and uh, uh they had uh, you know a bunch of samples that people were testing and and trying out and I uh, actually got to see the uh, Western Hunter guys as well, Western Hunter Magazine, Elk Hunter Magazine, uh, Nate Simmons, uh, Zach Bohe, and Ryan Hatfield. Um, they they had big crowds around them. I actually only got to speak to Nate because uh, I had to go catch a flight, but uh, uh, it was awesome to uh, see those guys and uh, just just an incredible um, you know display of hunters and sportsmen gathering and i love to go i you know i really liked going to sci uh, the week before and then going to this show in salt lake city was was uh, fantastic it's great to see the energy and the enthusiasm of of hunters out there and sportsmen and and uh, it's just a great encouragement for me i want to thank you guys for listening to this podcast i want to thank the sponsors for supporting this podcast and um you guys uh can send me comments and questions at my email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I wanted to answer a couple of questions. Oh, there's another one coming in right there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to answer a couple questions uh, that I got. And um, hopefully, if you guys have had these same questions, this will clear th some things up. It says, Jay... Uh, do you guys sell real estate statewide? Uh, that's from Bob. Um, Bob, you're referring to Dar Colburn and myself selling real estate. Yes, we are licensed in the state of Arizona. Uh, we work with my nephew, Jay Pyburn, and, and my dad, Bill Scott. Uh, I have been in real estate since 1997 when I got my real estate license. I believe Dar got his license in 2000. And uh, we have been selling real estate ever since. Yes, we are licensed and have the ability to sell um, all over the state. 
Uh, we primarily uh, work the Metro Phoenix area and uh, each person within our group kind of has their own specialty. Uh, we handle everything from uh, vacant land sales to ranches to uh, you know, rental properties to uh, multifamily properties. Uh, we help uh, people uh, find rental homes. Uh, we, we, we help people buy and sell uh, their own personal homes. We help people buy and sell uh, their income producing properties. And um, between the four of us, uh, we, we, we cover a lot of uh, business across uh, the Metro Phoenix area. So feel free if you have any questions in, re in regards to real estate, uh, Dar Colburn or myself uh, can answer those. And um, if we don't know the answer, we can certainly turn you on to someone that can. And I appreciate that, uh, I appreciate uh, that question. Uh, this question comes from Ted. He says, uh, Jay, I'm looking at getting a new spotting scope. Uh, what spotting scope do you recommend? Um, well, Ted, the spotting scope that I recommend actually is the Swarovski uh, 95 millimeter objective 30 by 70 eyepiece. And um, it is, it's, it's the STX. Um, it is the best spotting scope that I've ever looked through. I use it to do most all of my digiscoping through and um, cranked up to 70 power. Uh, it is an amazing spotting scope. Uh, the eye relief uh, at 30 or 70 power, um, as you crank it up to 70, um, you don't notice very much difference uh, there. And it, as far as it, it stays very good and clear all the way from 30 power to 70 power. I have had every generation uh, basically of a Swarovski spotting scope. Uh, going back to, I forget what they even call them, I think the CT80, um, which was a gray one. And then the next generation I got was the uh, STS80HD. And then uh, this new spotting scope I've used now for two hunting seasons. And um, it is fantastic. Uh, I actually, I'm a straight, I, or a straight spotting scope. Uh, uh, I tried to use the angled, I bought an angled and uh, actually uh, went back in and, and Cody sold me a straight eyepiece um, and I just couldn't get used to the angled eyepiece. Uh, actually, a guy at the show here asked me a question, uh, what I liked, whether angled or straight, and I, I like a straight eyepiece. I've just used that my whole life and it's kind of Ford Chevy. Some guys like the angled and I think that's fine. Uh, for me, the target a target acquisition uh, is, is much faster on a straight uh, eyepiece spotting scope. So I uh, hope that helps you out. Um, that is uh, my answer to what spotting scope I use. And uh, I, I can't say enough good things about uh, that spotting scope. So, um, guys, it's going to be a great two part episode here uh, with Andy Galliano. He's going to ask me a bunch of questions about Gould's turkey hunting uh, and about uh, uh, some other hunts that I've been on. And um, like I said, check his podcast out if you're into turkey hunting, the Turkey Hunter podcast. Uh, I listen to it uh, every week and um, he does a great job over there. Let's get right to the episode. At GoHunt.com, we are restoring the heritage of the old and constantly redefining the new. We stay focused and put our efforts into redefining the future of Western hunting. What makes us special? What makes us different? We are the new breed of hunter. We are the customers that we serve. We are the innovators and we are the future. Visit GoHunt.com slash insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. 
Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code until February 28th to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. I'm excited to have Jay Scott on the call with us today. Jay is with Colburn and Scott Outfitters and GouldsTurkeyHunts.com. And I wanted to get Jay on tonight to talk to us about just that, hunting the Goulds turkeys. And I have had the pleasure of hunting Goulds turkeys before, and I've actually killed two Goulds. And I can tell you that the experience of the hunt for a Goulds turkey is amazing. And so I know that not everyone can afford to do the Goulds hunt. Not everyone's going to have the opportunity to do a Goulds hunt. Not everyone's going to want to do a Goulds hunt. But a Goulds hunt is a turkey hunt. And there's nothing that I love more than talking about turkeys and turkey hunting. So I've got Jay on the call with us. Jay, how are you and where are you? I'm doing fantastic, uh, Andy. I've... Uh been looking forward to doing this podcast with you. I am actually in my hometown right now in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Scottsdale is a suburb of Phoenix about, uh, well, they're connected now, but it's on the north side of Phoenix. And yeah. uh, uh, weather is good. I was in uh, California last weekend for the spring opener for the Rio Grande turkeys over there. I took my nephews and uh, drove 600 miles to roost some birds. And uh, opening morning had four toms come into the to the uh, strutter decoy, and um, our hunt was finished in about 10 minutes. They both doubled off the roost, and so we had a fantastic time over there. I actually saw the video footage of that hunt on YouTube, and that is some incredible footage. You know, it was uh, it was awesome. We were able to uh, roost those birds. We've been hunting over there with a friend of mine that has a ranch, and we've been hunting over there, oh, seven, eight years, and... Um, we got over there in the evening, the night before the hunt, and, and got up high and just uh, started glassing and listening. We heard some birds uh, gobbling and were able to put our binoculars on them and watched them go up into the roost, but not. we didn't have the exact tree they were in. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we figured we could get in there pretty tight in the morning early, and we got in there pitch black dark and set up the decoys and just kind of sat there and let everything happen, and they started gobbling. And once it once it got light, I realized that we were in a good position. We had a single gobbler to our right, and we had three gobblers out about 125 yards kind of to our left. So we were kind of in the middle of them. Our decoys were set in the field. I had um, I like using the Dave Smith uh, decoys. We had the Dave Smith strutter and actually a Jake and, and some, uh, uh, some of the hens. And, I mean, it was really – I probably didn't have to call at all. I mean, they basically – Flew down, saw the decoys, and marched right over to them. So it was awesome. Yeah, it's beautiful country out there for sure. That really is some pretty country. And I was, at least from the video footage that you had, it didn't look like it was very wooded. Is that all pretty open, or was it just an? You you mentioned a field, so I didn't know. If, if yeah, no, it's it's um kind of ranch land. Uh, it's probably at a couple thousand feet of elevation, and it's they've got big black oaks. Um, they've got quite a bit of poison ivy over there as well, and and so the actual place where the turkeys were, um, I want to say was probably 150 yards by 150 yards, kind of a big grassy um cow cow pasture. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is pretty wooded. It's not wooded like probably what you're used to in Alabama where you have, you know, solid stands of, of hardwoods. But, it, it, you know, it, it's definitely they do have some cover. It's always beautiful green except for, you know, this year California is in a severe drought. So, yeah. you know, having gone the same weekend uh, for the last seven or eight years, it was definitely the driest I had seen it there. Wow. Okay. 
Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got into turkey hunting. You know, I, from the first time I went turkey hunting, I have fallen in love with it. Um, that's probably been 20 some years ago. And the first time I heard a turkey gobble and the first time I heard someone work a box call and have a turkey respond, uh, you know, I, I've basically wanted to be in the spring turkey woods from the time they're gobbling till the time they quit. And, um, fortunately, uh, in the last, say, 10 years of my life, I've been able to have the financial means to make that happen a lot of times and hunt in a lot of different places and, and basically just chase, you know, there's guys, I'm one of them that chases the, the fly fishing hatches and such, but mm -hmm. in the spring, I'm one to, you know, kind of follow the gobblers around and where they're gobbling, I want to be. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the guy that'll tell you, you know, I've shot a lot of turkeys and, and helped a lot of people get turkeys, but I'm still as shook up the first, you know, <laughs> this, this, the, however many I've shot on the last time as I am the first time. I mean, people say, geez, Jay, you, you know, you, you're an elk guide, a sheep guide, and, you know, you have elk standing, you know, 10 yards from your bugling and you're calm as can be, but you get a turkey next to you and you're just, I mean, I'm just, I'm a mess. Yeah. And I think that's what I love about turkey hunting so much. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they just think it's a, you know, for lack of a better term, they're just like, why do you like turkeys so much? They're just a dumb bird. Well, to me, it's everything about turkey hunting, uh, you know, from from all of the gear and all of the setup stuff and all of the strategy behind it and trying to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I talk about with guys, you know, turkey hunting in my in my mind is how you do it in the process. It's not just going out and killing a bird. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all the things that lead up to it, you know, strategizing with your buddies on where you're going to be sitting opening day, you know, what if the birds do this? What if they do that? You know, and going through all of that. So from an, I'm a real analytical type of person. And, and for me, you know, turkey hunting is all about the process. That's exactly right. That is one thing that really gets me into the sport more than anything else, and that is when I go into the woods after a turkey, and, well, let me say it this way. When I go into the turkey woods, whether I get on a gobbling turkey that day or I don't, everything else in the world goes away. Absolutely. Because my focus 100% is what should I do next? Okay, where should I go next? And so I think for – I'm very anal analytical as well, and I think for people like you and I, it is something that we can run through our head and go through all these processes and go through all these steps, and there's another step. There's always another step. There's another step. If there's a turkey gobbling, what's the next step? If there's not a turkey gobbling, what's the next step? So I can completely lose – everything else in the world and focus on turkey hunting and it truly is the one release that I have that is just that it is the yeah. release from everything else that's going on from work from home all the other stress is going on and that's what I focus on when I'm out there so I can. Yeah, I mean, I have a saying that, you know, it's eat, sleep, and kill, and, and, and it sounds kind of barbaric, but, I mean, I, I love just getting in that mode where you're, you're all focused, you're all in on the hunt, you don't have anything else going on, you block everything else out, and all you're thinking about is where do I need to be set up, and what can I do to be more efficient and do this better, and not that I'm focused on the kill at all, but I'm focused on trying to be efficient and trying to put myself and my hunters and my buddies in the best position we possibly can to get it done. Yeah. 
Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. Your saying and my saying kind of go hand in hand. My saying is there are killers and there's everybody else. (laughs) And you've got a choice. You can either be a killer or you can be everybody else. You don't necessarily have to squeeze the trigger every time you go out to be a killer. Absolutely. But it's, Absolutely. it's that mindset. It's that mentality of being on go and being on go in a second's notice. So. Yeah. And I think, I think you, you, you mentioned that you don't have to pull the trigger. Honestly, I think a lot of times I'm even more, say, intense or more focused when it's not even me that's hunting because I want to make sure that who's with me is going to have you know, the best opportunity and best experience they can. And, you know, so, you know, I get very upset with myself when I make dumb mistakes. And, you know, it, it, you don't have to hunt very long uh, to, to, to make mistakes. And, um, you know, every, every, it seems like every day I do something and then I question myself, you know, why did you do that? You know, that was lazy. You didn't do that. You know, you could have done this. And, you know, I think that's what, you know, guys with our personalities, that's just what we kind of thrive on. And and to a certain extent, I think you can get too analytical and and let it, you know, get too intense and too analytical. So one of the things I always try and do is just have fun with it and know that sometimes you're going to, you're going to be set up in the wrong spot. You know, you're going to be, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have birds coming in and all of a sudden, you know, you make a call that, and and you think, why did I even call? They were coming straight to me. And, you know, um, I think that sometimes I have to step back and remember this is all for fun and, you know, you're not always going to be efficient on every turkey that you try and go after. And I say that too. I haven't hunted eastern turkeys. I'm sure when I get to go out and hunt eastern turkeys, I'm going to get absolutely schooled, but I'm going to enjoy every second of it because it's all about the process. Yeah. And you may not get schooled. It just depends on the time of year that you come. That's right. I mean, sometimes they they can make you look good, and sometimes they can make you look silly, for sure. Very true. Very true. Well, let's talk about the Gould's turkey a little bit. What is a Gould's turkey, and what makes it different than the other turkeys that we find here in the U.S., the Easterns, the Merriams, the Rios, and the Osceola? What is different about a Gould's than those four? From my experience, I would say the Goulds are a bigger bird as far as, far as standing height from, from you know ground level to the top of their head. I'm going to think that they're probably the tallest bird out there. I, I can't speak for Easterns or Osceolas. I have not done that yet, but I, I have a lot of hunters tell me that their track is bigger, um, that obviously... I believe their tail fan to be actually a little bit bigger. I don't know if it is, but a lot of hunters that come hunt with me down in, in Mexico for Goulds, the first time they see a Goulds turkey strutted out, I mean, I try to explain it to them, and they just don't really get it. And then the look in their eyes when they first see a, a bird in full strut with that big white band on their tail, 
you know, it just makes them look so big um, and beautiful. Uh, the thing I really like about Gould's turkeys compared to the Merriams and Rios that I that I've I've hunted for a long time is uh, they're to me they're very callable. Uh, they they love to strut. They love to gobble. Um, they really work to the call well. Um, you know, you you. You can get away with not being the greatest caller and be just an average caller and do very well. And so they're a very user-friendly bird, in my opinion. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, they just don't get hunted. They don't get called to. And, you know, that they're not like an eastern bird that's on edge at all times. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think their gobble... Uh, Andy, you've hunted them. Their gobble is not, uh, you know, it's. I say it's kind of a cross between a Rio's and a, and a Merriam's. Um, but they love to strut, and you know, if, you, if you've watched any videos on my on my site, uh, GouldsTurkeyHunt.com, uh, you'll see that they they love to come to the decoys. They love to beat the decoys up, and you know, they're just a real user friendly bird. Yeah, they are. Without a doubt, the most beautiful turkey. And, you know, the, a lot of people say, well, the oscillated is beautiful. Well, yes, it is. But, and there are similarities in the oscillated and the other turkeys. But to me, the oscillated doesn't quite look like a turkey. Sure. And the Gould's turkey is a turkey. And it looks like a turkey. The white band, the white tipped tail feathers are stunning. They really are. There's such a contrast on a dark colored bird. Yeah. That, and they are the whitest of white. Yeah. That, and it makes that fan just look huge. I mean, you can attest, it just, that fan looks so big. And it might not be, but I always tell people I, I would love to actually get the primary feathers out and measure them. I think they're longer, but they, you know, they could be three inches shorter and, and, you know, I'm a total fool, but you, your impression and even my hunter's impression is they're like, oh man, that fan is so big. I would love to actually measure that up and, and, um, see, see if it is the case. You know, I may measure those, but I can tell you, I've got one of my Goulds full body mount. Then I've got another one that's just the saddle. Mm-hmm. Cape of it. Mm-hmm. The one that's full body mount, the bird looks to be about 15 to 20 percent larger than the Rio that I have next to it, mm-hmm. and maybe 10 percent larger than the Merriams that I have mounted mm-hmm. as well. So I think they are bigger, but I, I don't think weight wise, um, I hear about some of your Eastern turkeys, you know, 24 to 28 pounds. And yeah. I mean, I don't know that I've ever actually weighed a Gould. I'll be honest. I don't know that I've ever weighed one, mm-hmm. but you know, their feed is nothing like probably some of the feed that the guys have in the Midwest or that you guys have back, you know, back East. Right. Um, but I, th- I think they are a taller bird, um, from, from, you know, head, to, head to toe. Um, I definitely don't think weight wise they're as big, but they are stunning when they come in They're They are a fantastic bird to hunt. I have yet to take anybody that doesn't, isn't just blown away at the, the characteristics of the Goulds and how pretty they are. Yeah. When I first saw a picture of a Goulds in full strut, I knew I had to have one. Yes, and, absolutely. And they oscillated the same way. I, when I saw that bird in, in the, just beautiful coloration of that bird. I said, I've got to have one of those. I haven't done it yet, but it's on the list, and I'll get yeah, to me it, too. good Lord willing. So, Me too. Well, tell me a little bit about the habitat that the Gould's turkeys live in. Sure. The habitat, um, you know, here in Arizona, we have quite a few Goulds. Um, over the last, I don't know exactly, but over the last 10 years, the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, has been doing a phenomenal job here in, in combination with the game and fish. And in Arizona specifically, we have Gould's turkeys in, in southern Arizona, and they call them the Sky Islands. There's desert floors, and then there's these mountain chains that go all the way up to 8,000 feet, uh, maybe even in some 85, maybe 9,000 feet. 
And it's interesting, the Goulds actually uh, thrive in down on the desert floor, in the mid-chaparral, kind of mid-country, and then all the way up in the Ponderosa Pines. Mm. Um, you know, there's different units uh, here. Uh, you've got the Catalinas, the Galeros, the Chiricahuas, the Huachucas, um, the Santa Ritas. Uh, those are all, uh, there's other mountains as well, the Grams. Um, that have these goulds. Uh, so you, you run the full gamut of, of country. But in Mexico, uh, I hunt primarily in Sonora. And Sonora is a lot of kind of, um, I'd say it's about 4,000 to 5,000 feet. Uh, it's kind of mesquite, ocotillo, kind of coos deer type country. And then in the river bottoms and the creek bottoms, you know, you've got your big sycamores and cottonwoods. Uh, and that's what they, you know, they like to roost in. Um, but if you've ever been coos deer hunting, it's real similar to that country. And then on over into, um, Chihuahua, they've got a lot of, um, they call them Chihuahuan pines, uh, you know, all the way up into, you know, full blown, what looks like Ponderosa pine forests. Um, so it's a real vast terrain. I would say, uh, most of the Goulds country is fairly arid compared to probably what most people are used to. It might be a little more similar to Texas Rio's type country, but I'm going to say with a little bit more contour. It's definitely not flat like Texas. It def definitely has some roll, and they're definitely a mountain type bird. Yeah. Now, you brought up something that I think is is pretty interesting. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order in February 2016. The Goulds is making a comeback in the U.S. Absolutely. How much hunting is allowed of the Goulds in the U.S.? Yeah, and, and I can tell you, um, I can't give you exact numbers, but I can tell you like, uh, you know, say eight or nine years ago, a lot of the units had one or two Goulds turkey tags total. Mm -hmm. And now several of the units, I want to say, have two separate hunts that they've split into two hunts and I think have, you know, seven or eight, maybe nine, maybe even 10 permits per hunt. So, you know, a unit, uh, a unit that, you know, had one tag is now has five and five, five on the early, five on the late. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the Goulds has really come back. Um, I don't think they've done quite as well in New Mexico, but I know the success, you know, the, there's a huge success story in, in Southern Arizona with these Goulds for sure. If I had to guess, um, I want to say there's probably 50 permits in Arizona, um, total. And there might be even a few more than that. Um, whereas when they first reintroduced them, you know, there was a time when there was only, you know, maybe four or five in the whole state. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it's the National Wild Turkey Federation and the Game and Fish um, ha have done a fantastic job of uh, managing those birds for sure. Yeah, I know that, or it seems like I remember that when Arizona first opened up hunting for the Goulds, the NWTF got one of the permits and auctioned yep. it off. Yep. And then it seems like there was maybe one other that the yep. state of Arizona did uh, an auction for. And I think that was it. 
Yeah, and, and you know, they still have that today. Actually, this year is a very interesting year. I have the fortune of uh, a friend of mine bought the uh, Arizona Goulds auction tag. It's actually an any turkey tag, and we actually have Goulds, Merriams, and Rios. Uh, we have a small population of Rios on the Arizona Strip, which is separated by the Colorado River. That's an isolated pocket, but they can hunt any bird, but for for years that that auction ghoul or turkey hunter has chosen the goulds uh, i'm fortunate this year a friend of mine um from oregon actually purchased the tag and then we actually do two raffle tags and one of the raffle hunters uh is actually a a, a guy that i know from alabama ironically uh that uh is uh coming out to hunt and we actually are going out this weekend um, now that, that's a 365 tag. I, I believe you put in five dollars to win a chance at the raffle bird, mm-hmm. and they drew his name out of a hat. And then, and then my friend actually bought the auction tag, and I'm excited to go with both of them at separate times and take them to get their Goulds turkeys. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. Wow, that will be fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It's exciting. Now you mentioned that you mentioned some of the areas that we can find Gould, some of the mountain chains and that kind of thing, both in the U S and in Mexico where, and you, you also mentioned that the Goulds in Arizona are doing well at the higher elevations as well as the lower elevations. But typically in Mexico, do you find them in a certain area, certain elevation during season? Yeah, I would say that, um, where I hunt in Sonora, Mexico, which is uh, west of Chihuahua, Sonora, just, just to kind of picture it, is basically you take Arizona, and it's basically everything south of Arizona, and it bleeds over a little bit into New Mexico, and it bleeds a little bit over into California, but pretty much straight south of Arizona is is the state of Sonora, and most of my ranch, well, all of my ranches were, are anywhere within 30 to 50 miles of the of the U.S. border. And so really what those birds are is just a extension of those sky islands. And a lot of the country is very, very similar to the same mountain range that's, you know, 50 miles away in Arizona. You've got, you know, all the way from, say, 25 or, say, 1,500 feet up into the you know, where you get the mesquites that are, you know, in the, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 foot range. And then you've got the oaks that are in the, you know, 3,500 to 5,000 range. Then you go on up into the the, the uh, manzanita and the pines. To answer your question, most of the birds that we hunt in Sonora are kind of in that lower to mid-range country. Uh, they, they like to be around water. So a lot of times they're in the, the river bottoms and the drainages. Um, and... Conversely, in Chihuahua, a lot of the hunting is done at you know six, seven thousand feet, primarily all in the pines. Um, so Mexico definitely has a very diverse terrain. Yeah. Um, one of the key factors with Goulds is if you can find good water, uh, you're usually going to find Goulds turkeys. Yeah, that's something that they absolutely have to have. Yes, there is no well, there's a puddle here or a puddle there like they can do east of the Mississippi and and just find them a mud puddle to drink out of. There are no mud puddles. Yeah, it's a very arid place. And, and, and you know, there are times when it, it feels like a tropical jungle because they do get big monsoonal moisture. And, and, you know, actually in December and January when we're coos deer hunting down there, it can feel wet at times. But overall, it's a it's it's a pretty inhospitable place at times. Um, very beautiful in its own right, um, but a lot of beautiful cactus and and a lot of you know in the spring. I mainly hunt them like the first two weeks of May, and a lot of stuff's bloomed out, and it's just a beautiful time to be down there. Yeah. Now the ranches that you hunt, do they have guzzlers or water tanks? Most of the ranches, none of the ranches have guzzlers, so to speak. Most of the the water is um, what they call represos, uh, what we would call just cattle water tanks that are, you know, dirt tanks. Um, and then a lot of the drainages, uh, you know, have permanent water where there's tanajas or what we would call springs. 
and the Tanahas, uh, you know, down down a drainage. Uh, if, if it's got, you know, say puddles every, you know, if there's puddles every quarter mile, you know, pretty good sized little puddles from the springs, um, you will find turkeys there most often. Yeah. Okay. I was curious about that. The there's some windmills too, but it's mostly dirt tanks and, um, you know, just uh, just Tanahas. Yeah. The place that I hunted had tanks, and mm-hmm. that was a great place to set up mm-hmm. morning or afternoon. You knew birds were going to be coming in there to get something to drink. and Sure. There was no question about it. So water is key. Turkeys can eat just about anything but water is something they have to have. So in those arid areas, that's extremely important. Yeah, you know, um, speaking of eating, uh, last year towards the end of our hunts there in the middle of May, um, I was checking out to see what those turkeys were eating because I noticed they were leaving the roost and kind of just going out in pretty open country. And I had a suspicion I knew what they were eating. Um, There were grasshoppers all over, and I, I opened one up and and looked at it and and it was just I actually have a picture of it somewhere just chuck full of grasshoppers I mean like Andy like hundreds like wow. um as full as a turkey stomach can be uh full of grasshoppers I mean like the it was hard when I cut into it it was just so full of grasshoppers wow that's crazy yeah it's pretty cool well you talked a little bit about when you go to Mexico to hunt the Goulds, and you said it's the first two weeks of May. And I know that NWTF has really been working with the Mexican government to implement some seasons, an, an actual turkey season, to implement harvest limitations and that kind of thing. Has any of that actually taken place? As far as I know, uh, turkey season in Mexico for the whole country starts, I want to say March 15th, and it usually goes till May 31st, roughly. Those are rough dates. It's a fairly long and liberal season. Um, To be honest with you, I know that Gould's turkeys run all the way down into Durango and, you know, get, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles from uh, the border of the U.S. I had the furthest I've probably ever hunted turkeys south of the u.s border is probably about 50 miles Hmm. um and as far as the regulations i am not aware of any specific gould seasons uh i know that they actually issue tags they issue ranch contracts and permits for the turkeys um they call them wajalotes um uh, or pavo and as far as i know i don't know that there's any specific goulds and the other thing is I'm not sure how they handle it with the with the Rio Grande turkeys that are, you know, south of Texas. Right. I believe they're all one, you know, lumped under, you know, Guajalote. Okay. So there's no distinction from one to the other, you don't think? Not that I, not that I know of. Okay. Guys, I want to thank you for listening to the part one of this episode on Gould's turkey hunting with Andy Galliano, the host of the Turkey Hunter podcast. I also wanted to let you guys know that Dar Colburn and I are going to be doing a free turkey hunting seminar uh, for the Desert Christian Archers on Tuesday, March 15th, starting at 6 p.m. at Calvary Community Church, which is at 12612 North Black Canyon Highway. And uh, they are asking that you bring in Uh, food and toiletries Uh, bring any non-perishable food items or toiletries soap toothpaste deodorant uh, for the need uh, uh, needy families of Calvary so I want to invite everybody out there to come it's usually a great turnout Uh, a couple hundred people uh, show up and uh, Dar and I are going to do a seminar on turkey hunting so March 15th put it on your calendars and uh, make sure to bring some non-perishable food items or toiletries, uh, and we'll see you there. And make sure to stay tuned to uh, or tune in to part two uh, with Andy Galliano and myself talking about Gould's turkeys on the next episode.